Right, we've reached the end of our third masterclass um, where we've been talking about OTP. So I think in this final discussion, we're going to talk a bit about OTP and then we want to focus on the direction Erlang is going, where it's going in the future and so on. But I'm going to start out, um, I think we all realise that when people often talk about Erlang, they mean Erlang OTP. And perhaps, Francesco, do you want to say something about that? How, how Erlang OTP is used and how it's so important in... in, in well, any system yeah, used out in industry is, yeah, uses OTP. It's, uh -huh. basic, it's the foundation of any system. It provides the tool sets which allow you to create releases and uh, you know, create your clusters and manage them. And at the same time, they can put uh, Erlang into the hands of you know, even uh, programmers who don't quite master concurrency yet. Mm as all of the dangerous things are taken care of for you. Uh, so it's sort of de in, in the behaviors. Yeah, because yeah. they just write the callbacks and that's... Yeah. And this so, came so, out so, of... Some people will continue thinking, you know, after work, you know, have I handled that race condition? What yes. happens if, you know, this process executes after the other? Well, it's others at five just clock off. And no matter, you know, what type of programmer it is, if they've used OTP, it's they don't need to worry about it. I think it, it's yeah. an unfortunate name because it, it very, doesn't reflect very. what it does. Yes. I mean, open, well, it's got nothing to do with telecoms. Well, yeah. and, but it, but, it, well, but it, in a sense, it reflects the, it reflects the place the it came yeah. from. But and it, the, the I, I, I would, concurrency. Yeah, I would use the analogy of, of you know, C and Unix and, and then Erlang and OTP. Yeah. I mean, well, OTP is the, yeah. the application operating system, so it plays mm. the role of Unix mm. and uh, Visa VC. I mean, if you had raw C, you'd have to write a heck of a lot of stuff to do anything. But if you're using Unix, you've got all the tools and the libraries. And so I think yeah. that's the relationship and between... And what, what's and really language. interesting is seeing you know, other uh, language communities uh, realizing the importance of OTP and actually cloning it and trying to clone it in some shape yeah. or form. Where I mean, it's maybe not apparent, but we've got 15 people in Ericsson who've built that stuff for 20 years. So, mm. so there's something like you know, 200, it 250 like man years of work it was, in it. It is, it, it's it is interesting the amount of work there is in there. Yes. I, though it's, it's intriguing that there is not huge support for what you might call enterprise replication or whatever at the OTP level. So you have one gen server, for example. But we've concentrated on things like trying to get the, the, the leadership election correct. Mm, I mean, the amount sure. of work in, in that is yeah. enormous. And, and we believe, you know, we hope that's correct because that's theoretically mm. very difficult to do. But do you think that in one of the directions that OTP might go in is to try and support, put in more support for you know, replicated gen servers to, to build in fault tolerance at the OTP level? I think, I mean, I, I would actually like to see much better documentation. Okay. Because, I mean, we've, we've, we've taken the step of hiring a technical author in, uh -huh. in, in the hope that this will improve matters because there's an awful lot of stuff that's in there that's actually quite good. Um, but but, but well, it was designed for internal use within Ericsson where the people who are using it could come and ask the people who'd written it. Yes. And, and, and that's adequate for that purpose. Mm. But it's not so good when, when people are using it outside because they can't come and ask us. I so, I so it needs yeah. a, new, a good book. Well, there is yeah, a good book on the way. It's, it's called Designing for Scalability with Erlang OTP, which yeah, Stephen Ovsky and I are writing. Right. So sounds hopefully... But it, but it needs more spe specialised yeah. books yeah. on how to replicate data. And Absolutely. Like yes. Absolutely. But I think it's... I'm almost seeing the whole replication uh, being a layer on top of OTP. So OTP will cover a single node. Yes. Then, then on then top of it, you want your distributed models because you know, they mm. will vary based on needs. Yeah. There is no one size fits all. Mm. So, um, so is that a library or is it, a, is it something more? Yeah, I, I, I is it something stronger than a library? It's something it stronger a, than a library, but which you can bolt on top of a single on, Erlang so node. It's, it's a layer, it's which another gives layer. you, you know, different yeah. cluster patterns, it gives you different scalability patterns, and your different fault tolerance patterns because you know, every, every system out there is unique. Mm. And I, I you can't have a generic solution for everyone. Distributed pro I think it's like walking over a minefield. Yes. Be because there, there, there are problems which don't look difficult, which are mm. really black holes of complexity. And mm -hmm. there are other things which uh, are pretty easy. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of... And lot I, I think we've done the work on the difficult bits. Mm. But there's, and I think you're hinting, there's a lot of work... People have done a lot of work in this area, but it's maybe not been shared in the best. Yeah, I mean, Gen Leader or something like that. We, we, you know, you know yeah. various theoreticians have, oh, yeah, sure. have worked on yeah. that, trying to yeah. prove it correct and yeah. things like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a that's a state of the art stuff there. And so but of course, we use it in. I mean, Ericsson, we use it in products. Mm. We're, we're controlling a large proportion of the world's telecoms networks using this stuff. So it has to be right. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it has to run and reboot itself, and, and it has to correct errors. 
back, automatically with nobody there. Sure. Otherwise, half the world's telecoms networks would fail. But it's interesting that there are now many more users. So it's not, Ericsson is still a very yes, big user, yes. and, and, it, and it's used in various different ways. I, I, I understand. But now there are lots of different users. Yes. And is that putting a strain on... on is it, is, are demands being put on Erlang that it can't deliver very well? You know, can, it, can it deliver the sort of scalability know, in, in yes, WhatsApp, can, say? I, or I you know, where are the pressure points, do you think, from your yeah. customers? It, it, the, the interesting part is, well, the pressure points outside of Ericsson are very different from the pressure points within Ericsson. Yeah. So what, what are the main but ones outside, would you say? It's looking at massive scalability where they try to you know, push out every, the last CPU cycle on every single machine. You know, WhatsApp were the first ones to scale the Erlang VM you know, to manage two million simultaneously open TCP IP connections, mm -hmm. for example. And, you know, and so the, the, these features were coming from outside and not within Ericsson. Right. Mm. But, but I think one of the problems is unrealistic expectations. I mean, Erlang wasn't sure. designed to be the fastest system in the world. Oh, it no. was designed to be the, the most fault-tolerant system Indeed. in the world. Oh, yeah, and, sure. And, no, I appreciate and, that. And, yeah. and, and I've always thought that, you know, so if you want more performance, if, if you've got an architecture that allows you to scale horizontally, you can just add more processors. Mm. And that, that's a kind of correct decision because we've seen the price of processors and the, oh, the price yeah. of horizontal scaling to go down yeah. dr drastically. Yeah. So we're going to see 1,000 thousand core CPUs, but hopefully yeah. this year. You know, and if, we, if you can scale your software out horizontally, yeah. but, uh, then but, performance problems yeah. just go away. But the away. interesting thing there is, you know, how, good is, how well is Erlang doing in the multi-core space? It's doing very well. Yeah. I mean, inside Ericsson, we've, we've taken some some applications uh, which which were written before they were multi-cores so mm. these are old applications mm. and, and they were written using lots of lightweight processes ran them on a, on a 64 core Tylera machine went 33 times faster without mm. doing anything to the mm. code yeah. just there it was but but the C++ things weren't going any faster at all no, because sure. they had no well, concurrency because it's built them. using concurrency yes, that's yes. right yeah. Yeah. We, we've often run into you know bottlenecks however when dealing with uh, multi you know we were trying to scale existing Erlang system on multi core architectures and it's Amdahl's right. law you've got code yeah. which is ser your, your serial but code is your bottleneck but if you think about it we we are and doing something that nobody else is doing you see we are running concurrent programs and looking for the bottlenecks in it other yeah. people are running okay. sequential programs yeah. and okay. looking for, for the, the concurrency, concurrency in yeah. it exactly. yeah yeah so so yeah. we're already yeah. like 20 yeah. years ahead yeah. oh yeah, yeah. sure yeah. Yeah. but where do you okay so we're saying we're 20 years ahead yeah. and we're talking a, a bit about where things are in the near future i'd like you to speculate a bit further you know what how will, how different will airline be in 10 15 years time i don't do you know think? but i where will I it be I going? Think if, if you look at the original design, we didn't imagine concurrency or distribution, distributed clusters going outside a local area network. Yeah. So, so we imagined them being in a cluster with 100 machines, oh no, 10 machines in within a, for, within and, a firewall. And, and behind a firewall. Yes, exactly. behind a firewall. So, yeah. so the typical use case yeah. was 10 relatively powerful machines inside a, fi inside a corporate firewall. Yeah. The, the, the usage patterns, we weren't thinking of millions of machines loosely connected with, with a lot mm. of security problems. You know, in the cloud, for example. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so, what so do you, you know, how do you think Erlang might evolve I in the I see a very natural connection between the large-scale peer-to-peer networks and yeah. distributed hash tables and, and security mechanisms and things. Mm. So, so lightweight things communicating through secure protocols. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and then yeah. I, I also see this as, as addressing one of the big problems we have of, of systems become unmanageable when they become large monolithic clumps. Mm. So if we can split them into small things... I mean, I'm really small yeah, is beautiful. Let's, let's, have, oh yeah? let's yeah. have small communicating uh, uh, yeah, components. I'm, I'm loving the whole you know, discussion of yeah. microservices these days. It's, you know, we've been doing it yeah. for a long time. But yeah. you know, to add to what Joe's saying, you know, I'm seeing a lot happening you know, running Erlang on the bare metal, mm. you know, running an Erlang-based OS, uh, Erlang on Zen. Yeah. And what's happening is that you know, it's still on an experimental level. I don't think we'll see any production code for another probably three, four, maybe five mm. years. But integrating a soft switch into yeah, the Erlang sure. VM and then using software-defined networking principles. So Erlang all the way down. Yeah, well, Erlang all the way yeah. down and then using software-defined networking principles to create these secure connections Joe was talking about. You, know, you can yeah. fire off you know, thousands well, of Erlang VMs yeah. in milliseconds. You then need to quickly connect them up and then tear down these connections and make sure they're secure. But it, the thing that makes all that possible so. is the fact there's no shared data. Yeah, and oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, sure. yeah. and yeah, the yeah, asynchronous yeah, yeah, message yeah, passing, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, and that's where I'm seeing it. So you know, it's a completely different uh, programming yes. paradigm, yeah. very different to what we're used to today. But 
Well, it's not. It a, it, it's always. I mean, there's always been the shared memory versus versus but message passing. But it's the context. But, it's but the everybody. Context, had, the context is. But it was. Yeah, but it was it, widely yes. believed and that 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 share the message passing systems would not be efficient because of all the copying that's involved. And I think that's sure. the thing we've shown is wrong. Yes. Yeah. Well, in, in inappropriate applications. Well, yes. yes. That's right. And then, the, yeah. of course, the benefit. Suddenly, you've got this benefit of caching. Yes. Because yeah, yeah. because modern processes are like the data under their feet, and shared data is really a no-no. So yeah. so non-shared data was introduced for the purposes of error recovery mm. because you can't recover if you've got dangling pointers but it turns out to have enormous benefits for scalability for cash, yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. for comprehensibility of the system yeah, sure great well i think that's a fantastic point to stop you know we can see erlang has got a bright future so come back in 10 years time and see where we've got to thanks very much thanks thanks everyone thank you.